Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and co-parents of all ages, this podcast is for you. Introducing in the center ring the amicable divorce expert, Judith Weigel. In the world of divorce, the settlement agreement is where everybody is headed. That's what we call the divorce decree, so to speak, that has everything from soup to nuts. It has custody, spousal support, child support, division of assets and debts, and anything else you want to throw in. But getting there is so difficult sometimes. And we have, as our guest in Center Ring today, An attorney, Natalie Lowe, who I adore more than you know, because when I met Natalie, it was in the middle of a series of mediations, and one of her clients was part of the couple. Uh, Natalie had been working with her, um, providing legal counsel all along, and just hadn't joined us in the mediation yet. But it was time for her to join. We needed an attorney. Her client needed the stability, the security, and the calm that Natalie brought to her. And when I met Natalie, she was the perfect addition to the mediation. And this is the best way I can introduce you, Natalie, because I honestly mean it. I was so lucky to meet you. Your representation of your client and the way you interfaced with the other party, I, it, I couldn't have asked for any better. So, Natalie, welcome to the program. Thank you so much, Judith. Um, as you know, the feeling is completely mutual. Uh, my client that you referred to had an enormous amount of trust in you, and I think that was because... She felt heard, and she was able to share with you what she wanted, why she wanted it, her vulnerabilities, and it was because of that trust that you developed with her that she felt comfortable having you help craft the terms of settlement, which thankfully, we were successful in doing. (laughs) Uh, Eventually, yes, you were. Thank you very much for the return compliment. Let's look at the word trust. I love that you brought up trust because not only did she have to trust me as the mediator, but she had to trust you as her attorney. So maybe we can start with why are settlements, what makes a settlement prohibitive? What makes it a rocky road? getting to where you have to get to eventually uh, in an out-of-court settlement. Um, Everybody has to agree at some point in time. She definitely had a lot of trust in you. And I saw the way you behaved. And it was so cool because people do not have the best impressions of attorneys. When they need them, they need them, but everybody fears them. And sometimes you want the pit bull attorney, which I don't know advantages anybody. What's your opinion about that term? The, okay, there's two issues there. First of all, the pit bull attorney might be good if you're going to court, right? But even still, the judges these days are not, that's, that style is no longer working. Judges want lawyer, want to see lawyers who work with each other and are cooperative, respectful. They do not want rude, obnoxious, overly zealous, aggressive lawyers. It might make the client feel good to see their lawyer flexing muscles for them, but it's just a show and it doesn't get the client what they want ultimately. And if you're talking about, right, like if we talk about court, then you are entrusting a complete stranger wearing a black robe to make decisions about your children, your hard-earned assets and money, and basically your future. And it's really, really dangerous. Um, so that's why in my opinion, mediation is 
by far the best place to go. And the reason why is because it allows the parties to craft terms of settlement that work for them, not arbitrary rules and terms dictated by a judge. And inside the mediation, what is prohibitive is, I think it comes down to what is the motivating factor, right? What what does a client want? Each client has something that they really, really want. And likewise, they have a very, very, you know, they have an Achilles tendon, something that is, you can't touch, for example, custody. And, you know, there are certain issues that when you poke them, it hurts and it turns them off. It shuts them down and the conversation ends and people want to walk out of rooms. So I think that in the mediation, the reason why we were so successful in the, in the case that you're discussing is because you were able to identify the motivating factor, right? It can't be about depriving the other side of something. Someone can't want 90% custody just because they don't want the other side to have 50-50, right? They have to want what they want because it's in the best interest of either the children or their assets and for both spouses going forward. And so in the case that you're referring to, the trust was developed because you listened to both clients, both parties of the divorce. And each side did have something that they really, really wanted and something that was a big soft spot for them, their Achilles tendon. And when you have a mediator especially with the help of lawyers that on both sides who are not interested in churning fees, who are actually settlement, you know, oriented, um, you are able to have those discussions, identify the issues that both sides want, the reasons why, and craft a creative settlement that gives both sides the best of both worlds and send them out, both of them being happy, right? There's a that common term or phrase that the judges, you know, at MCLE events will discuss and they say, you know, you have a good agreement when both sides leave unhappy. In mediation, it doesn't have to be that way. Both sides can be happy because instead of a judge or two lawyers who are not truly interested in the best interest of their client and as the fam- of the family as a whole, then you actually are able to craft settlements that leave both sides happy. I'm really happy <laughs> to, to hear you say the opposite of what is the mantra, and that is, I think it's the old mantra, that the the mark of a good mediation, the mark of a good negotiation is when both people leave unhappy. And that's even in a business deal. Right. Much like um, these settlements are. But I, I disagree with that. I think that perfectly said, the Achilles tendon analogy and visual is perfect because everybody has those sensitivities, those pain points, those must-haves. And you have to listen to why they want the must-haves. What's the background on it? And if you can deal with the background, the fear, the pain point, then that can soften voluntarily by the person who initially requested it because sometimes it's just too much. It's not going to fly. You're right. compromising the other person. But how much of that can you get that is reasonable, that's based on logic, that's based on best interest, that's based on the law? <laughs> Somehow, mm-hmm. some way you have to put the law in there. Yes, you know, we, you and I and anybody in, in our field listens to there's the law, then there's what works for both of you. And that's great if what works for both of you works for both of you. But if only one of you wants to bend the law and the other doesn't, okay, so now we're going to have to move the pieces of the puzzle around and and figure out what this settlement looks like. 
And, and I think a good example just to illustrate is when, to, when, you know, a mom and dad are getting a divorce and there's obviously children involved in this case. Let's say, you know, dad is, a, he's employed full time. Mom historically was a stay at home mom. They have two children in school, right? Absent a showing of a parent being unfit, downtown, a court is going to order 50-50, right? And so that means on dad's time, he's probably going to have to hire a nanny or housekeeper, you know, someone to pick up the kids after school, take them to extracurriculars. And moms, at least a lot of the mothers who I deal with, they don't want them. That, that's their Achilles tendon. They want a parent to be there to pick up the children and to take them to extracurriculars and to, you know, be present with them. And so a good compromise that you wouldn't get in court is, let's say on dad's days, mom picks up the kids from school, takes them, you know, go gets food, takes them to their extracurriculars, whatever it is going on after school. And then when dad gets off work, mom drops off the kids at dad's house and he has his overnight. In exchange for that, the parties can agree, right? Because dad doesn't want to pay child support through the nose to accommodate mom wanting to have more of a timeshare with the children. Then the parties can agree that in exchange for the father allowing mom to pick up the kids from school on his days, that child support will be calculated 50-50, regardless of the actual timeshare, if it's 85 15 or whatever the actual percentage is, right? So that's a good example that dad doesn't have to pay through the nose. So he gets what he wants. Mom gets to be with the children and that is in everyone's best interest. It's in mom's best interest, dad's best interest, and most importantly, the children's best interest. Such a good point. Such a, a realistic good point that happens quite frequently and for anybody to know listening to this if both parties agree to a sp specific percentage in time sharing and in your case 50 50 even though it may not be exactly 50 50 it's okay you can do that because you've Great. accommodated different aspects of it and it just happens to work. The, the court doesn't care, do they? As long as both parents agree. Right. As long as there's a statement in the judgment that the child support ordered is going to meet the reasonable needs of the children, right? Then it just has to be written up properly. But it also provides a built that those terms, there's a built in insurance policy, right? Because if mom says, okay, I want more child support because I have the kid, you know, I want timeshare to be, uh, sorry, um, child support to be calculated based on the actual timeshare, then dad's just going to swoop in and say, okay, then I'm going to exercise my 50-50 custody, right? Similarly, if dad wants 50-50 custody, then, you know, there's insurance policies on both sides that ensure that that agreement going forward continues to work and neither side goes back in, you know, when the signatures on the judgment are still wet and they're filing a request for order seeking to modify. I'm laughing. Yes, that can happen. <laughs> yeah, so, so it's important it's when crafting the terms that you have these sort of built-in insurance policies to keep the parties out of court going forward. Yes. Okay. So... In the world of settlement agreements, that's what everybody's heading towards. Of course, that's what everybody fears at the same time is different aspects of a settlement agreement that um, have different priorities to each of them. So in the process of getting to a settlement agreement, we have several steps, slightly different in each state, but basically it's the same. An initial mm -hmm. filing, you get a case number, documents come back, other party is served, they file a response, all good, moving right along. Part two, we have the instruments, so to speak, the paperwork 
that opens the door to the settlement agreement. In California, they're called disclosure forms. I'm kind of thinking in just about every state, they're called disclosure forms, a financial statement, and then some type of form that lists assets and debts. This is what agreements are about. Mine, it's the children and child support and the visitation schedule, pretty and, and spousal support, alimony. The, uh, the bulk of this then is about assets and debts and how you divide them. Mm-hmm. One of the things, Natalie, that I have found is really important, and you almost don't know it until you're there, is the timing of all of it. So just to start the process is emotional. You know, Correct. getting people to talk about the divorce and then somehow execute the filing, that's a really big deal. Getting the disclosures done is the bane of everybody's existence. Mm-hmm. Not only the clients, but us, right? All the legal professionals, it's like, oh gosh, now we have to do the disclosure. I have now. one that I need to do today and I have been dreading it for weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and and why are you dreading it? What's the what are the aspects of this that because it's signed under penalty of perjury, right? And it's this is a list of all of my assets and debt, and this is my income, these are my expenses. And let's say you have the in spouse, right? So we have the in spouse, the party who um, you know, has, has all the, the money. earning. Yeah, they know where everything is. They know what assets are owned, where accounts are held, what names they're in. You know, they are usually the working parent, right? And then you have the other parent, the so-called out spouse, who is dealing with, you know, making sure that groceries, you know, are in the pantry, picking up the kids from school. And so they run the household versus the finances. So on both sides, it's difficult. When you have the in-spouse, they have to list everything and they're petrified that, oh, you know, did I forget an account? Did I, is there a a bank account somewhere that has a thousand dollars in it that I'm just forgetting? So they delay, delay, delay because they are so scared that they're going to omit an asset inadvertently and it's going to come back and haunt them. Similarly, when you have the out spouse, they don't know what is owned, right? So a lot of times they're just copying verbatim what the in spouse has listed on their disclosures because otherwise they only know what bank, you know, okay, I have a Bank of America checking account that ends in 4529 and this is how much is in it. They know that there are other bank accounts out there, brokerage accounts, retirement accounts, but they don't know where they're held. They don't know how much is in them. They, they're they not the party who the statements are sent to. And so both sides are, it's very different, difficult to elicit that information from your clients and get it on the form, sent to them and get it signed under penalty of perjury. Speaking of penalty of perjury, what do you do when your client says to you, Do I have to really list everything? I mean, I don't understand why. I've had this investment for so long. My parents gave me this stock when I was born. Um, I I just bought this property after the date of separation. Uh, Why do they have to know what I have in other countries? And they're literally telling you this. I tell them you have to list it. You have to list community property, separate property, all of it. Why? And then I, I cite them the Rossi case. I love in California, this. Please, please right? say it. I love this case. Which is one party had bought a lottery ticket with $1 of community property money. Happened to be a winning lottery ticket. The lottery ticket was not the $1 lottery ticket that they didn't know was a winning ticket was not listed on the disclosure form. The other party later found out that it was a winning lottery ticket. And in the case of non-disclosure by one party, the court has jurisdiction to award up to 100% of the undisclosed asset to the other party. And so in the Rossi case, the lottery winnings, what the judge did is he slammed the person who didn't list it and awarded 100% of the proceeds 
to the other party over a $1 lottery ticket. Okay, I understand the winnings were huge. And I, I didn't know that it was $1 out of community property money. I thought it was completely after the date of separation, totally separate property money, but still needed to be disclosed. But no, that's... It, it doesn't matter. Even if... Even it, if it was separate property, right? It correct. needed to be disclosed. It needs to be Got disclosed. It. Obviously, with a community property asset, the court is more likely to slam the party who doesn't disclose it. In that case, right, it was Judge Denner who made that decision. And he was, he's, you know, he has since passed and, but he was a great judge, but he wanted to make a point and he sure did. Mm -hmm. And so it helps the lawyers, right, explain Mm -hmm. to the client, you need to disclose this. You are at a huge risk. First of all, I won't, Sign. I will not serve disclosure documents that I know to be incomplete. I'm not going to be an accomplice in, you know, hiding assets. That's just not the type of lawyer I am. But getting them to disclose it as long as you, the way to get them to to follow the rules, if they're hesitant, is by telling them that you can risk losing 100% of that asset. And then they want to list everything. Because if you can actually prove that it's your separate property, what do you have to hide by list by listing it? You're going to prove it's your separate. Exactly right. So Natalie, did you ever have a situation, even either after the Rossi case or even before, where you just said plain old, no, this process is about disclosing separate property assets and debts as well as community property assets and debts under penalty of perjury and a judge can take this all away from you and your clients still say, I don't care, I'll risk it. Have you ever had then that? I have had that happen. Um, not frequently, um, thankfully, but I will not, if, if that is the way that a party wants to litigate their case, then I'm not the right lawyer for them. It's so nice to hear. I, I say, you know, if this relationship is not going to work, you need to seek new counsel. And luckily that's only happened to me once. And, but, you know, usually my clients want to list. They're more concerned about accidentally omitting an asset, right? Right. Which can be fixed. If, if a party is, you know, if a, you serve a disclosure document, and it's under penalty of perjury, obviously. And then they were like, oh, shoot, I forgot I have, you know, a credit union account from way back in college and it has 500. You just amend it and you serve the other side. You correct your mistakes along the way. And that's what I tell them. If you are in good faith accidentally forgetting something on here, we can amend it, right? It's just the second you learn about it, you need to tell me and then we'll fix it. Right. And that has happened before on my side and on the other side. And that's so normal. As, yeah, that, that's, that's normal. easy. That's right. normal. And nobody should worry about that because, right. yes, until you send in the final filing, which includes the settlement agreement, you can fix anything. And even if something comes to light once you've filed the settlement agreement that it hasn't been signed off on, you can pull it back. Of course. Of yeah. course. Yeah. Okay. Very easy to fix. You just have yeah. to have the right you know, intention. The right intentions, good faith and, you know, upfront and honest. That's just all oh, that's all I ask for from my clients. And me too, by the way. Okay. So there's this thing leading up to the beginning of the negotiation for the settlement. And let's just say they're unrepresented parties. Well, you know what? It doesn't matter. Unrepresented or represented. The, my, my example doesn't matter. So you think you're ready. And as you start the negotiations, it's too emotional. You can't really come back to the table yet. You need time. Or the first time you engage in a conversation, whether it's in a mediation on your own, or there's four people at the table, the two parties and their two lawyers, 
um, there's this thing that I talk about all the time and other professionals talk about it and it's the emotional divorce versus the legal divorce. And these two divorces run concurrently throughout the filing. It would be great in a perfect world if people went through the emotions of getting the divorce before they started filing, because then they're calmer, maybe some forgiveness has been given, maybe there's an apology or two, and just, honey, it just didn't work out. You know, when you get to the negotiation, don't you, Natalie, whether it's too emotional and maybe everybody has to pull back. Have you seen Mm -hmm. that happen? All the time. And the term I like to use is staying, sometimes a party wants to stay connected through the conflict, right? They're not ready to let go of this relationship. They know it's over deep down, but they're just not ready. Let's say the other side cheated on them or they are upset that the California community property system requires 50-50 division of at Whatever the reason is that they're upset, they want to stay connected to the other party through the conflict, which is a very, very negative downward spiral. And you have to pull back, whether they you know, go see a therapist or time heals. And not a lot of time. You, know, you can't just let things drag on for months and months on end. But you have to get out of that emotional phase and get back to being objective and handling your divorce as a business transaction, right? At the end of the day, a marriage is a contract. You're, it's, a, it's a business contract, right? That's what the definition of marriage is. And so if that's how you enter it, that's the same way you're going to get out of it. And so you can't be in that emotional phase. You can't, like, you know, what we were discussing before, you can't want something because you, the re, and have the reason why you want it being to deprive the other party of something. You have to pull back and get that person to the objective phase and the, um, you know, the business transaction so that the terms can be discussed, negotiated, and agreed upon in an environment absent emotion. Obviously, there's always going to be some emotion present, but when you have that blockage, the emotion that is blocking and is just too much on the surface there's too much anger or sadness or hurt whatever it may be you have to pull back and I I, there's usually one time in a case when it's ripe for settlement right there's always that perfect time when it's perfectly right sometimes it's not ready yet and and you have to seize upon that and so that's you know, sometimes you can't, you know, the lawyer can't, I as a lawyer can't force my client to get out of that emotional phase. It takes time. It takes work on their end. Sometimes it takes a therapy session or two. And sometimes it just takes a few weeks to pass, right? And then they can come back to the table with a clear head and go over the terms and hopefully start to make progress going forward. And we really don't know what's going on in the background, or I know less of what's going on in the background than maybe you do. People who have representation, I think will typically share a lot of what's going on in their personal lives. Do you think so with you? Yes. With lawyers? Yeah. Yes. Um, but still, there's some things they don't even think to share that may right. be the real pivotal points that are necessary to get to so that the negotiation can move forward. And here's what it looks like. Here's what a mediation or negotiation looks like that needs to be stopped, yelling and screaming. They can't calmly talk to one another or in the middle of discussing how something will be divided the reason for the divorce will come up. Well, you know what? You cheated and you're still doing it. And they bring up, you know, the ills of the past. It's like Tourette's. They, they can't, it's so overwhelming to them. What happened to them? 
Right. And not that deep seated, right? It's, you know, when you think of, for example, custody, one of, uh, there was a judge downtown, I won't name his name, but we were in chambers and he, he gave an, a, a wonderful example. He said, you know, I'll have parties in court who, you know, are arguing over a 16, custody of a 16 year old. And the one argument mom wants to make is, you know, dad wasn't present at the hospital when, you know, so-and-so was born. He wants to go way back to the birth, right? And the judge actually, he said, you know, they, they need to be heard. So he lets that go for a little bit, which is why, me, you know, most judges are not as kind as he is. He was very, but he understands that need to be heard, which is exactly in the case that we most recently had together. Um, you know, both sides felt heard. And I know that for a fact, they, they told me. And so that really helps get people to a settlement phase. Um, obviously, there's always going to be that surface emotion, right? Which is sometimes just requires five minutes of cooling off. So in your office, right? You'll just say, okay, Natalie, why don't you and your client come over here and go into this room? You just separate the parties. And then you kind of go back and forth and talk them down and get them back to a calm state and we can continue to move forward. So that, you know, that surface level emotion is always going to be there. And the way you handled it in your office was the perfect way, right? Okay, let's just separate, take a beat and reconvene in five or 10 minutes. And, but it's that deep, deep seated emotion that really blocks settlement of, of terms, right? To get past, in, that, that should be handled before you go into. Ideal, yeah, ideally, yes. Um, but, you know, it doesn't always happen that way. Of but it, it does sometimes. The other thing is, so you come to an agreement. It looks like all parties are done. Okay, great. And then you adjourn and the settlement agreement is fluffed up and, or written for the first time, written or modified. You send it out and then you hear crickets. One party responds immediately, okay, this is fine. I don't see anything that needs to be changed. The other party isn't even answering the phone or responding to emails. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's okay. They, they're now really looking at their future. This is how I assume. And the reality of single parent or single person, uh, yes, I have this spousal and child support coming in. But if the fear about living on their own financially is where they are, you kind of just have to wait for a little bit, don't you? And maybe... I agree 100%. It's difficult. I mean, think about it. If you have a, a settlement agreement in front of you written on black and white paper, and whether you're the party who is going to be paying support or the party who's receiving it, the party paying, it's a really difficult document to sign you know, I'm going to owe this amount of child and spousal support per month. And it's not that they don't want to do it. It's financially very scary, right? It's a lot of money. And even if they look at their historical earnings, they can, you know, they can see, okay, I've always made this in the past. Therefore, I'm going to be able to afford it. But everybody has a fear about their future, right? They don't know that they're always going to be bringing in this amount of money. And so how can I agree to pay this? It's really scary. Likewise, if you're the recipient of, you know, the payee, then you're thinking about all your bills. And then let's say you're, you know, you have a tuition bill, you know, something that comes in the door and you're worried, how am I going to live on this? Am I going to have to take out a second on my home? I have to refinance and do a cash out. Am I going to be able to afford this for the rest of my life, right? And so both sides, it is difficult to sign. And sometimes it just takes time for the parties to get there emotionally and they have to prepare themselves mentally. Sometimes it takes, you know, them speaking with their lawyers or the media, you know, just asking questions that, may, that they're thinking of later that they didn't think of at the time. And it's not that they are 
regretting. They're just, you know, circling around this big issue and they want to make sure that this term or these terms are going to be financially feasible and, you know, they just have questions like, okay, well, what if I don't continue to earn this amount of money? What, am I okay? Or, am I, you know, am I going to have to declare bankruptcy? So you go through all of the different issues with them and that's how you get them ultimately to sign. But it does just take time and sometimes people have to, you know, just sit on it for a month. And it is scary, right? Yeah. And I mean, even it might take, unbeknownst to any of us who are professionals, it might take just a life incident unrelated to the divorce that all of a sudden makes them feel better, feel secure. Okay, I got this. I can do this. And for everybody listening, just to know, just about everything in the world of support is modifiable. You know, certainly in California, that word modifiable, that sentence has to go into child support. But if you write it in spousal support, okay, there's the breathing room for the payor. Right. So just to know and, that. And sometimes it takes, right, like if if this is the amount of temper, like let's say the financial arrangement is the same during the pendency of the divorce versus after the judgment has been entered, sometimes it just takes a month or two of one person paying, the other person receiving. So the party who's paying says, okay, I can afford this, right? They actually experience it firsthand. And the party receiving the support is able to pay their bills. And it's just that passage of time and operating under those terms that brings them to the point that they're ready to sign and ready to have the document filed with the court and entered as a judgment. And start their new life. That's the other side of this Mm -hmm. that I think it's maybe easy for us not to see because we're so involved with the paperwork and the timing and the this and the that. But they are starting a new life. And maybe you're dealing with somebody who's never lived by on their own before. There are mm-hmm. still people that go from growing up, living in their homes, to getting married. Right. Even if they work after college or after high school, they still don't get their own place. That's a big deal to it think is. about living on your own for the first time. And especially when you're sharing children. You know, that first holiday without your kid there. But it's actually interesting. I find that during the divorce proceedings, both sides want the kids. Everybody's fighting over having custody. And then the second the judgment is entered, it's, you know, hey, I want to go to Aspen for a week. Do you mind, you know, is it okay if we switch weeks or will you cover for me on this day? It becomes the complete opposite. (laughs) <laughs> which I find really interesting, right? So, um, and that's a good thing because then, you know, they start to work together and those fights actually turn into favor asking, which builds trust and yeah. is really good for everyone. In continuing on with the emotional aspect of the negotiations, There are times when people are too emotionally attached to an asset, i.e. the house, biggest asset to be attached to, and that in and of itself becomes the great struggle. Let's explore that, being emotionally attached to an asset, and let's use the house as the example. The one who wants to stay in it is quite often the one who can't afford it. What do we do? Well, there's two options. First is figure out a way to equalize the property division that enables the spouse who wants to stay and keep the house to be able to afford the monthly payments, right? So let's say all of the other assets, the retirement accounts, the brokerage accounts, all the other assets, are awarded to the other party. So then you end up with an equal division that actually enables the spouse to stay, right? Or if that is, if there are, you know, if assets don't exist, you know, if there's just a house and a few bank accounts and the equity of the house is too great 
to equalize, then it is going to need to be sold. And actually, I had a client who was so emotionally attached to her house. She wanted it more than anything. I looked at what they had. And I said, you're going to have, you have to sell this house. You, you're not going to be able to afford to keep it. There's just no way. How are you going to come up with, you know, X number of hundred thousand dollars to pay your spouse in order to buy him out? She did sell the house. They split the net sale proceeds and it was the best thing that ever happened to her. She didn't realize how much that house was hold, you know, keeping her in that relationship after she had been divorced. So she was like, oh, I feel so free. I don't have an emotion. You know, I can celebrate Christmas or Thanksgiving, you know, whatever holiday, free of the memories. You know, it, the Christmas tree is not in the same location, in the same room, right? It's a new life. And she was never happier. She was like, I, she can't even you know, fathom why she wanted to keep the house. And she says, you know, I don't know why I wanted to hold on to the house. Like it was, I guess maybe being in the property market, you know, she wanted to remain an owner, but overall she is so much happier with the house being sold and being free of all those emotional ties and memories that exist in the house. So and either way, it's a good, you know, it, you can figure it out and resolve the house issue in a positive way, whether it's sold or kept. Right. I think it's the way it's presented more than anything to show the upside of selling it. One of the other things that, you know, I, I'm just careful about stepping over this one particular line when we're talking about the house, and that is the kids grew up here. All, all of our family memories are here. How am I going to tell this to the kids? What have you found in your years of practicing uh, our, priority, our priorities with the kids? I think it depends on their ages, right? If they are in high school, then most of the time the parents will agree, like, let's, let's hold on to the house. We only have one or two more years before they're off to college, Right. That's one story. But when you have younger kids, you, the house, it, it's really not the house itself that presents the problem. It's the fact that their parents aren't together, right? They're going to be celebrating a holiday with only one parent, not as a family. And so, you know, sometimes, a lot of times, the house is kept. And the children have their new holiday schedule and the parent who keeps the house celebrates with the children in the house. Granted, it usually looks a lot different because of the furniture division and um, everybody kind of wants a house makeover after the divorce so that they can start anew, even in that old environment. Um, and so... But I find a lot of times it's actually better, even if they can afford it, to start this new life, not only for the parties, but for the kids, right? It's okay. Change is good. Change, people get used to it and they like it, right? And so, and it's exciting. Kids get new rooms, they get to decorate and, you know, pick out uh, little sheets, you know, and new new environment is always healthy for them it is a transition but kids are really resilient they they bounce back as long as they have the love and support of both parents then they will make it through they will be resilient and so we i try not to i try to look at the house from a financial perspective not from oh, we're going to hurt the kids' feelings. The kids already are dealing with their parents going through a divorce. The house is nothing compared to the much bigger issue that they're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And getting the kids in therapy and giving them that environment to express their feelings and process them in a healthy right. way is really the way to go. So I can't try and keep the house as a financial issue, not a custody issue. 
Exactly. And haven't we all heard from watching some wonderful videos on children, just children, and how they feel and react in a divorce? And all these videos seem to be the same. At the end of the day, the, the children just want their parents to get along. Okay, a new house, who cares? Can right. I still have my friends? Love to still have my friends, especially if you like them. If you don't, then great, move out of the neighborhood. But it's really about parents getting along. And one of my other uh, interviewees uh, last year, Julie Turner, who's a life coach, she was, she was saying, you are an emotionally changed person by virtue of this divorce. You are not the same person. I mean, your core is the same, but your outward expression of who you are, you've gone through a major change. Let go of as much as you can let go of so that you can fulfill your greater destiny. Right. That's what you're blocking by holding on to these tangibles. Now, if this is a house that's been in the family for generations, whole different story. Of course. But that's not really the case most of the time. Mm -hmm. And also getting, I I wrote that point that you made that it's about parents getting along after the divorce. I actually, I think it was yesterday or the day before in the Washington Post, there was, it was kind of like a Dear Abby type of letter. And it was from the perspective of a child. And this was years and years after the divorce. And I can't remember now what event it was, maybe a wedding or a graduation. And the child, now, you know, a teenager, was noting that her uncle, right? So it wasn't even necessarily limited to mom and dad. It was like the camps, the two families, right? So mom's family, dad's family. You know, the uncle wouldn't go if the mom was going to be at this event. And she was like, can't everybody just get along for me, right? And so I, it is so important after the divorce that the mom and dad, they don't need to like each other. They don't need to be best friends, but they need to show up for their kids and not put their own egos before the best interests of their kids. They need to show up and they need everybody who's on, quote, their side to follow their lead and be there for the kids because that's what will negatively affect the kids the most long-term. And if everybody can get on the same page about getting, you know, showing up and being in there for the kids and, you know, being cordial enough and to be in the same room and not have any negative toxic vibes, then children appreciate that. They need that. And that's when the kids of divorce will excel in life in every single way. And that's what will make the parents feel really good about themselves and they won't yes, through themselves true. about that I ruin my children's lives. No, look, they're flourishing. They love you. It's great. Mm-hmm. They, yeah. They can live in your basement after they graduate from college. Not- <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I want to go in a different direction because this is important too, Natalie, and it's kind of the flip side of what we've been talking about. And that is... When the lawyers or the mediators are the problem, when the, and mediators are right in there too. There are some very, very expensive mediators that take a little too much time dragging out the mediation. And sometimes lawyers that are not you, that are more financially influenced, that could tend to drag out the proceedings or, or maybe be too argumentative with opposing counsel and not really get the job done. Can you speak to that a little bit, please? Of course. So the first thing is, um, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, but it's a reality that lawyers get paid by the hour, right? So the more hours, the longer something takes, the more the lawyer gets paid. Likewise, the mediator, you know, you can go to these fancy retired judges and what, it's $10,000 a day. Yes. And so they're also getting paid by the hour. And so you have a lot of conflicting, if 
financial interest, right? And it's unfortunately far too common that lawyers, especially in Los Angeles, for some reason, they will derail proceeding, uh, you know, negotiations for no good reason whatsoever, other than to line their own pockets financially. And it's really important that both sides pick a lawyer who they trust is ethical, moral, and, you know, will not engage in illegal conduct, right? That they pick a lawyer who they believe has their best interests at heart. And, and both sides need that because all it takes is one bad apple to derail everything. And similarly with the, you know, like if you go to a retired judge, some of them are just way too harsh and it will cause one side to shut down. And then the whole day is wasted. No agreement is reached. And then to go back for a second day, it's another $10,000. So it's really important that the players, you know, the two lawyers, the mediator are good people, ethical people, and are interested in getting to the end, not dragging it out and spending time unnecessarily propounding discovery and, you know, the serving the 35 page, you know, 45 category demand for production of documents, which is the most enormous waste of time. Thank you. Thank you for saying it's an enormous waste of time. When I see that come through, especially to somebody who's an Uber driver living in their parents' basement who 80 years old, they can't take care of themselves and can't afford uh, their own, uh, you know, care, daily care. You're going to serve this man who just gave up the family house and isn't asking for spousal support, demand for production. Anybody listening, giant red flag, unless there's real distrust, unless you really think your spouse is hiding assets, right? Right, right. You could have, you know, a a doctor or a dentist on one side and a teacher on, you know, whatever the, the occupations of the parties are. And... The demand for production will ask for, you know, corporate tax returns, minutes, um, you know, articles of incorporation. Everybody knows that there is no corporation, right? It's a sole proprietor or a W-2 wage earner. But these demands for production contain, you know, you have to go through and tailor it to your case. If you're going to serve one, which is, I, I don't mind discovery that's narrowly tailored, But when it's the blanket, you know, you open your master file, change the names and click print and just use that for every case. It's just churning fees because it's causing the other side to have to respond to it. And that takes a lot of time and money. And then when the documents come in, you have to go through, you know, one by one, each category. What did I request? What did I get? Right. And so it, consumes time on both sides. And at the end of the day, there's only a finite amount of money in the estate that to be divided. And you can spend it on attorney's fees and costs, or you can divide it between the two of you. And, you know, hopefully you're not going to take your, you know, savings that could be spent on your children's college education to fund, you know, discovery disputes and motions to compel and you know, just unnecessary fee churning to be a thorn in the side to the other parent or spouse. So lesson going forward, if you unfortunately are with a mediator or an attorney that seems to be blocking a smooth movement forward and you're feeling frustrated, get rid of them. Go on to Absolutely. somebody else. There's, yeah. In any town, there's plenty of family law attorneys that you can call. It is so important to trust your lawyer, your mediator. There is nothing more important. Yes. Yes. And yes, likewise, because- the attorneys and the mediators mm-hmm. have to trust. Trust each other too. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And their own clients. 
Trust is a big, it, it, really, that is a key word all the way around. The trust generally has been broken if there was an event in the marriage that was untoward, that wasn't, that, 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 um, wasn't planned for, mm-hmm. <laughs> wasn't mutually agreed upon. So there, so there's that. And, and so there's that backdrop of the marriage that will come into play in the divorce and might be a driving factor in behavior. But the trust you have to have in any of the professionals that you hire, even therapists to help you move on, a divorce mm-hmm. coach, change them. Don't work with somebody that your your gut tells you is wrong or you visibly are not engaging with well. Mm-hmm. You need a well-oiled team uh, to work with you. Yeah, you want to be proud of the person who you select to represent you to mediate your case you don't want to be you know cringe embarrassed like you don't want to read their letters and you know read a nasty letter from a lawyer to another it it doesn't look good it's not there's no class in that it's it's unnecessary it's the most obvious form of fee churning and my advice is run If I hadn't heard this with my own ears, it would be hard to believe, but I was sitting at an evening seminar some years ago at one of the bar associations, and it was a small table. Uh, We were having dinner before the seminar started, and there were two independent attorneys uh, speaking to one another. They've known each other for years. They'd been in practice for a while, you could tell. And one attorney says to the other attorney, you know, I got this great new case in today. Okay, good. You got a great new case. And I just heard from opposing counsel today. The attorney who was speaking had the wife. The opposing counsel had the husband. And apparently there was a lot of money to go around. And it was already determined that husband was going to pay wife's legal fees. I mean, there, there were these assumptions mm-hmm. the way this was presented. I just got a call from opposing counsel today, and he said, get ready, I'm going to paper you to death. <laughs> Shocking, right? <laughs> so that was it. Nothing more was said. And I, because I'm sitting three inches from them, these tables are so small, I said, I'm so sorry, I wasn't eavesdropping, but we're sitting on top of one another, and I find this a fascinating story. How did you respond to opposing counsel? And the attorney said, what are you talking about? I said, well, how did you respond? You kind of left off with just opposing counsel's words, but not your response. And the attorney said, well, how should I have responded? I said, any number of ways. I'm sorry, this is completely unethical. It's mm-hmm. against attorney uh, morals and ethics. You're tying up the court with unnecessary filings when there are people who really need the court and their time. And you're asking me to take money while I'm purposely allowing my client to be upset. Like any one of these things would be a valid response. Mm-hmm. Did you say any of those? And this attorney just stared at me, said nothing. And I said, look, I'm not an attorney. I'm a legal document preparation company. And this is why I have a job. This type of behind the scenes Mm -hmm. maneuvering purely for profit and gain. And then the seminar started. We didn't say anything else. That, to me, set the bar in a way that I said, I have to make it my mission to be um, as open, forthright, and honest as possible. Um, I, I have to surround myself with excellent attorneys like yourself. I'm so proud that I know you and I feel very lucky that I do. And I've been lucky in the attorneys who have come into my world. Mm-hmm. And So I want people to know this, that there are some phenomenal attorneys like Natalie that would never do anything untoward to their client and money is not the goal. Yes, you have to get paid for what you do and she's phenomenal. Right. But that's not why you're doing this. I'll make this really quick, I promise. So I had a case and my client called me at one o'clock in the morning 
And I answer the phone thinking there's an emergency. And she says to me that she's in Denmark with the high school son. And she says, I want you to go in on a move away. I want to move to Denmark and I want to enroll him in high school here. Granted, you're not allowed to travel outside of the country pending a divorce without the written consent of the other parent. So I asked her, did you tell dad that you were going to Denmark? No. So I said, you need to get on the next flight back now. And the first thing in the morning, I am going to call the other side and tell them where you are and that you're on your way home. So she comes home and she wants me to go in on a move away. There are certain, you know, legal criteria for a move away, but really in this case, she just wanted to move out of the country. She had no family in Denmark, nothing. There was absolutely nothing in Denmark except for no dad, right? Dad was stuck here in LA for work. And I said, also, not to mention the fact that you you can't afford, move away litigation is incredibly expensive if it's opposed, which in this case, it, it would be. And she said, well, I have X number of dollars in retirement money. And there is an exception in the actress that you can pay to retirement accounts for fees and costs. And I said, listen, you need to find a new lawyer. This, we're not a good fit. And I, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to spend your entire retirement savings on a baseless move away action to Denmark that has no merit in law or fact. And so she finally, the Friday comes along and I said, did you find a new attorney? And she tells me so-and-so is going to take my case. She said one of these, you know, top lawyers in Los Angeles who has a name that everybody knows. And I said, I didn't believe it, you know. Sure enough, the sub of attorney comes in and he took it. So the next week there was on there was a Wednesday Beverly Hills Bar event, Beverly Hills Bar Association event, I should say. And so I see him, you know, in the little cocktail hour and I went up to him and I said his name and I said, I never thought you would take my sloppy second. And he said, you know, Natalie, you you gotta get the money. You know, if if they can pay for it, you take the money and you go, you're too green. This was a hundred years ago, but I will never forget that. And of course they did litigate it. She lost and their retirement money went to law firms. It bankrupted their family. And it happens too many times, it, you know, with both sides wanting to do something that may little sense. And if, so if you have a lawyer or someone telling you something can happen and it seems too good to be true, most of the time it's because it is too good to be true. You're probably going to need second, you know, a second opinion to make sure that you're not just being fed to the wolves, really. Absolutely. And, and, And you can be fodder for the wolves if you're not careful. Yes. Natalie, we've come to the end of our time, which was like five minutes. It felt like we started this conversation. <laughs> I want to give some takeaways before we have uh, give your contact information out. So the takeaways are honesty is the best policy, not only Always. when you're disclosing what you uh, have, but when you're disclosing how you feel and what you need emotionally and the time you may need. So honesty is the best policy. Getting the best professionals around who are not interested in the money but are interested in you and getting this done as efficiently as possible so you can go on and live your life, Mm -hmm. your new life, because you do have a new life. Fear is at the heart of everything. There's fear on both sides. If you're fearful, your spouse is fearful. Even mm-hmm. they may not sound like it, but everybody has fear. So please to be understanding of that fear. Don't hang on to an asset that will cost you to hang on to it. Move on, get the money, cash out, get that life happening uh, as soon as you can. And take the time you need. If you need a little time, go ahead and take it. It's okay. Don't take it to hurt the other person. Take it so that when you come back to the negotiation, you're making a strong decision that you can live with. Did I miss any takeaways? 
Not that I can think of. Just no. I think you you covered everything, and you know, always. I think one other thing though I will say is always think about your kids. What is in their best interest? Don't make it about you. Don't make it about the other parent. Take the emotion out of it and focus on your kids. What do they need? What do they want? And do it for them. Don't do it for yourself. Don't do it for your lawyer. Don't do it for the other side. Do it for them. That's a really good way to recenter yourself if, you know, in a divorce proceeding and to make sure that you are making good decisions that will be in the best interest of your entire family going forward after the divorce into your new life. Well said. Well said. Natalie, for people to get in touch with you, although it's going to be in the show notes, how would they get in touch with you? Telephone is my preferred method of contact. Um, My office number is 310-361-8531. And that's by far the best way to reach me. My office is in Century City. And uh, yeah. Okay, so that's so that's old it. school. I love old school. I love the phone. <laughs> this email has gotten out of control. To say Natalie's number one more time, three in Los Angeles, Century City, 310-361-8531. You have been not only a godsend to the legal world, thank you so much for being an attorney, a family law attorney. Ditto. Thank you so much for being on the program. I really appreciate this discussion, Natalie. Thank you for inviting me, Judith. I, I will never forget the times that we have worked together and the effectiveness of you as a mediator and how actually both sides went away happy. Yeah. Yeah. And touche, touche. Uh, The footnote on this, by the way, and I'm so sorry, because this is important to know, and I don't want anybody to worry about this. There was a point after seven mediations that the parties absolutely needed their attorneys to finish the discussion because they had gotten to such a great point, but it was a little imbalanced with one party not having an attorney speak for them and the other party having you, although you were great with the other party, I thought, you know what, this is really cool. And this is a very positive way of having legal counsel step in and just finish it because I knew who the other attorney was going to be and I completely respect her. And I thought, okay, this is going to be great. She's not a taker. She listens like Natalie listens. And I expect to get a call with the settlement soon. And you did. And it was the same settlement that we had reached in your office. It was just, you know, silly argument over how something, the language of the agreement, but the, the terms were the exact same. Yeah. Yeah. No, that was great. So, so if you have to have attorneys polish it off, please don't feel badly. Whatever works, right. that's what you should have done. Natalie, thank you so much. Thank you, Judith. My pleasure. I couldn't wait for this. And thank all of you for listening. I appreciate all of you. I hope every topic that we bring uh, makes a difference in an amicable resolution to your divorce. You can reach me through my email address for the podcast, judith at theamicabledivorceexpert.com, judith at theamicabledivorceexpert.com. Please share this with your friends, subscribe if you haven't, and as always, have an amicable day. That's our show for today. Thank you for joining us. Be good to yourselves, be kind to your spouse, and cherish your children above all else. 